Okay. Thank you so Forum? much, guys. Really, thank you. No, thank you, bro. What's your name? I'm Phil. Phil, okay. Phil, <laughs> by the way. Well, you know, you? first time. No, no, it's, it's okay. Hello. This is Pete Sandoval, drummer from Terrorizer. How you all doing? Hi, I'm Lee Harrison. I'm the guitar player for Terrorizer. I am also the drummer for Monstrosity. What do you love the most about drum, Pete? About drumming? About, yeah, about the whole drumming thing. What is that turns you on the most? I love drumming for speed and for... You know, drums are the backbone of the music. The foundation, the, you know, I've been into the style of music that I've been playing for, you guys know since when. And that's what I love it because it's challenging. Well, back those days, there was no death metal. I didn't know death metal. I only, I only knew hardcore. The hardest bands were like Master Repulsion. And I guess Nippon Dead was around too, but I didn't hear from them after we had done the uh, World Downfall album. It was naturally for me, because to be honest, before, like back in uh, 85, uh, 84, sometime in 84, I think 85, I tried to play guitar, you know. I, I even have some pictures back then when I, you know, I'm just trying to be a guitar player. But it didn't work for me after a few months. And then I started to realize the drums were like the things, you know. Every time I hear, like, even if I heard, like, bands like, you know, Judas Priest, Scorpions, let's say, um, Van Halen, you know, it was the drums the, that I felt. I just decided, hey, I want it, you know. It came to me like, I, I want to play drums. You know, I would practice without drums, of course, like in my house, you know, on a chair, you know, a pillow, I used to put a pillow and just pretend like I'm playing. So everything was by ear. I, I never learned how to play drums by, you know, I didn't go to school, I didn't have a train, I didn't have a teacher. Uh, I taught myself. And eventually, after I knew that the drums were my thing, you know, I was always, I was always seeking for new bands that were more heavy, more extreme than the previous bands. Then, you know, I found Hellhammer, back to the Sentence of Dead Destruction, come on, you know, that was like, wow, you know. Kill Em All, that album, it's history for me, and Show No Mercy, of course. Then, when I hear this kind of trash, I go, Psh, no, 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 I wanna, I, I love this, I love speed. So speed was natural for me, you know. And I learned uh, the skank beat, which was popular back then, the Slayer beat. Then I thought, hey, I want to do double the speed. But remember, I never played double bass before I joined Morbid Angel. It was only one kick drum. It was one, one foot blast beat. That's why they call me one foot blast or whatever. But this is how I thought, hey, man, I want to double the speed. You know what I mean? So that's how everything started, you know, speed, you know. I just wanted to make things faster somehow, you know. There was not that kind of music back then in 86, come on. That was when I started with Terrorizer in 86. 87, we made some demos. So that was the beginning for me, you know what I mean? I wanted to take things to the next level as far as speed. And that was the, the logical way. Were you aware of Mick Harris and Napalm Death already? Uh, I wasn't aware of Napalm Death as much because remember, in 86, what did Napalm Death have? Like I 85. Because they were doing stuff, right? Yeah, but what did they have, though, that, that for me to hear, though? They, was, they didn't have they an have album demos? yet. Oh, and still, I mean, there was a, 
I mean, 87 and up, of course, came uh, Napalm Dead, Carcass, Ball Thrower. So you those. didn't discover the blast beat through them? No, 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 no. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know anything about those bands. You know, I was not a grindcore fan. In fact, uh, Jesse and Oscar Garcia, guys from Terrorizer, they used to listen like to Master Repulsion. They were influenced by this kind of grindcore already. I was nine, I didn't know what a grind, grindcore war. Come on, you know, I was listening to Slayer, Show No Mercy, Hunting the Chapel, Sodom, and that's when I started practicing the blast beat slowly, of course, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Everything was like this back then, you know, two, three, four, one. And this practice, you know, got me to where I am right now. That was 80, you know, 86 earlier. So it is great. I just love playing drums. That's it. What do you like playing drums? Well, for me, it just, you know, it just came more naturally, I think. You know, I was gonna be a guitar player first. I picked up the guitar, but I'm left-handed. So I, uh, my dad kind of forced me to play right-handed. So it was kind of a discouragement. And then uh, my dad had a friend who had an apartment complex and he rented to a drummer named Steve Rucker. And eventually he went on to become the Bee Gees drummer for 10 years in the 90s. But before that, he taught me how to play some, you know, my first lessons. You know, I just had a five-piece kit in there, all mic'd up, and you know, I remember the first lesson was What a Fool Believes from Doobie Brothers. And then the second lesson, he let me just go off and not worry about anything and just let me, and that was the first time it really clicked for me. You know, the drumming would like, you know, I just felt, wow, you know. Before that, you know, I had spoons on magazines. Then I my dad built me a little wooden pad with a rubber, used the inner tube tire. He glued it to this wood and I used that as a stick pad. Then I had cardboard boxes like Tommy Lee, before Tommy Lee though. And so I had <laughs> basketball in a garbage can. That was my ride symbol, because it would get that little ping. I'd gotten one snare for like Christmas or my birthday or something. And then I had the wood block, and so I had my cardboard. So I was doing, you know, stuff before I could even had a drum set, you know. I actually play a lot of my rock beats right-handed and a lot of like the kind of the straighter stuff, but when I go for the pure speed, I usually end up switching over to the left and kind of a natural uh, thing that I do, but uh, at the same time, I try to work my, you know. You're using the right foot and the left yeah, hand. It's, it's right kind of odd to me. It yeah. looks weird. And I lead my doubles with the left, so it's kind of weird. And Sean Reiner does the same thing. In 88, when I was looking for a band, you know, I was a drummer and ended up hanging around Cynic. And Cynic were kind of already established. They were starting to play local shows. They were thrash. They weren't really into the jazz like they are now. And, you know, I, I met Mark Banner, the bass player, the original bass player for Monstrosity. He was in Cynic at the time. And in the process, I ended up auditioning for Hell Witch, which was a, a Florida band at the time. And, there, you know, he was the one who told me, you know, oh, you got to play the super fast. He called the blast beat the super fast beat. You know, so that was the first time I'd heard about the super fast beat, the blast beat. And he wanted me to play it, and they, they had it already in their songs and stuff. So I had to, you know, I was learning it for learn the Hell Witch songs. Even, you know, joining Malevolent I, after I after Hell Witch, I ended up joining Malevolent for a year, and. Like a lot of the early stuff, you know, we'd be doing like, just like a ba 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 not really double time in the hi-hats or the ride, you know? And at, at first I really didn't understand, you know what I mean? To me it was like, I just didn't get the whole, you know, the art of the drumming, you know, if you will. And then eventually, you know, once, I, it was actually this guy right here, you know, once I saw him doing the double time and all that, I kind of, you know, and then I realized Dave Lombardo's doing the double time and all that. And so everybody calls that the cheap beat, right? You know? So right, no. Um.
Yeah, this is the, uh, our actual uh, long tour that we do. It feels great. I mean, you know, the first shows were a little harder, you know, because you are uh, you warming up. But now this is like the, our sixth show, I believe, of the tour. You know, opening for Nile is such a such a great honor. You know, George Collier is such an amazing drummer. Uh, we're starting to enjoy this tour more and more. The the, the, the thing that is a kind of it's kind of cold, you know. It's like <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know it's winter time. It's the wrong and place for just a short, right? And I haven't been on a long tour for a while, but uh, it brings me back to the memories, you know, back then when I used to tour with Morbid Angel, so many tours we did, and it just is starting to become like natural, you know, that thing that I want to do, that thing that I am good at. So, hey, I'm having such a great time, a lot of fun, enjoying playing the set. So all is great, man. I mean, what else can I say? You know, each show gets better and better. Absolutely. <laughs> I think, you know, in the 90s and late 80s, <clears throat> there wasn't the handbook that the kids have now. You know, now they can go to YouTube, they can see, they learn all, okay, get the axis pedals, put the spring tension on full, you know what I mean? Right. They oh, learn triggers. These, they there was learn no these, triggers they back learn then either. There was no triggers, there was none of that. So it was more of a, you kind of had to figure things out on your own, you know? You didn't have these tips and exercise, you know, because we're, we're still learning. We're naive ourselves, you know, like learning these things as we go, you know, and it's now that other drummers can look and see what, you know, he's done and things that I've done and, you know, take those lessons and kind of put them all together and, and present them in a new way like Derek Roddy did, for example. I think Derek for, was the first one to really like kind of put it all together, though. He did the book, he did the, you know, explained it and the way he explained it and kind of took it to the next level, you know, the, and kind of got more into the drum business aspect of, you know, with the, the, the company, drum companies and getting them involved. Whereas like the, the clinic guys were kind of on a different path, you know what I mean? It was like a kind of a different genre, if you will. Now it's kind of more combined a little more, I see, you know, you have these, you know, drummers that would play like, you know, they're checking out these death metal guys and go, wow, you know? So there's a little more like, we're looking at you, they're looking at me type thing. until after, you know, Morbid already had recorded their record, Obituary, kind of put... Massacre. Sabotage was the big yeah. Tampa band, you know? It was more like kind of that. Bands, some bands kind of, they traveled and moved to Florida, and it's not because, you know, oh, you know, it's the death metal scene of the world. It's because Florida has a nice, has a nice climate, has a nice temperature. Most people love Florida because it's called a sunshine state, you know? It's not, it's only probably two or three months out of the year that it gets cold. And that is nice, warm. I mean, come on. So that's one reason why I think a lot of bands like to move there because come on, I didn't, I didn't live in Florida. You know, I was in California in LA with Terrorizer. We, we had two demos, 87 I was there, then 88. You know, I get a call from Morbid, you know what I mean, blah, blah, blah. And 
I moved to, to Florida, so, and Morbi uh, wasn't actually from Florida either. They were, I mean, Trey was from Florida, I guess. Trey was, I mean, he started his band, and Mike Browning, yes, and Richard Burnell, but David and, uh, and the drummer Wayne, and there's bands that have moved down there, and that makes it interesting for other bands because, oh, that's the capital, the death metal capital of the world. And it's, you know, a lot of things have to do with it. It's beaches, nice beaches. A lot had to do with Morris Sound recording, too, just because everybody wanted to, you know. The, in the studio, the Morris Sound was, you know, got so, so popular, yeah. very, but that's the way it is, man. The first album, Imperial Doom, kind of had that, it was, you know, around the 91-ish era, and if you listen to the album Images and Words from Dream Theater, you'll notice that this, the snare drum and the kicks kind of have the same sound, and, and the, the way they did that was that they took the kick off of the tape head and ran it through a sampler, and then ran it back to the tape. And then they did the same thing with the snare drum too. So the snare drum is very monotone, you know, it's one level all the way through. So like if you listen to Images and Words, you know, he does all these little ghost strokes, but they come out as like these full hits, like he's hitting like this. So in our album, Imperial Doom was the same way, you know, it was just had that over amped snare. And so with Millennium, you know, I can, we, we didn't want that again, really. We didn't really like that, you know, we wanted to have a little more dynamics. And then also, we mixed in uh, Criteria Studios, which was down in uh, Miami, which is where Fleetwood Mac recorded Rumors, and Bee Gees recorded all their hits, and Ted Nugent did Weekend Warriors, Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell, blah, blah, blah. So we went down there thinking, you know, this is a world-class studio, it's gonna be great. And they actually didn't know how to do the, tr the, the triggering that Morrison was doing. You know, it was kind of, they just didn't understand it. So the drums on Millennium are actually very natural because of that, you know, the kicks are all, you know, those are the real kicks. There's no triggers on it. So, yeah. And so it's a real organic album. It's, to me, it's a little dry, you know, sounding. I like the, the, the next record, In Dark Purity, was more of a, where I like the production really hit, you know, and because, you know, it has the power of the triggers, but it's not overly like, you know, it just doesn't sound, it sounds a little more real, you know, like if I hit a little bit lighter, it triggers a little bit lighter. If it hits harder, it triggers harder. So it goes with my natural sound, but it also has the power that the triggering, you can't get with just microphones, you know, I'm sorry, people. What's your favorite drum sound, Morbid Angel? Well, the thing is, the, first of all, it was recorded in Morris Sound Studios. One of the greatest studios for back, you know, those days for recording. Covenant, Plus obviously, Fleming, right? Fleming. also the producer, we had some guy flown from, from Europe. His name is Fleming. Like, you know, he worked with us for the sound, you know, in the studio, you know. And by Covenant, we were more, you know, you know, a little more together, more grown up, more like, more tied together, like a family. Then Covenant was born, you know, and it is the way it is, you know, it was a letter C, it had to be the C, because it is not a D, or, or the B. So, so therefore, yeah, Covenant is one of my favorite, one of my favorite albums, definitely. Uh, so is Formulas. Formulas is, it was the comeback, because, yeah. you know. It's a lot more singer. natural. Heretic is also pretty cool. It's got some cool ideas there. You know, in the uh, classic ones, you know, which most people like and love, you know, altars and bless you the sick, man, you know. But coming in was a mixture of uh, a great producer, great album, and we were, and we were like, uh, we wrote some killer music for that album, I guess.
I would say it's about 50-50. Um, like on the Millennium album, for example, a song like Mirrors of Reason, that's kind of like written around the drums, if you will, you know, where I had the drum patterns first. Whereas a song like Storm Winds is more guitar written first. I like to mix it up with other people though. I don't like to just hog the song. I like, I like to write the song and then have other people work with it. So I like writing you know, a drum skeleton and then writing riffs to fit the drum skeleton. And then I like having it where the riffs are first and the drums fit, the, you know, so I don't have any one way of doing it, but um, these days it seems to be, I just set the click and I'll just write riffs and then I'll import them in and then I'll chop them all off and I'll have every riff separated and I'll like pretty much figure out what the key of the riff is and kind of, I'll play with them and I'll have an idea usually in my head of where it's gonna go. But definitely in the early days I had, you know, there was a lot more uh, written around the drums a little bit more maybe, you know, with the cymbal catches and the, those kind of beats. Like I had beats that I wanted to use, you know, like Immense Malignancy, there's like a little cymbal catch thing where I do like, ch -ch -ch, you know, things like that. First of all, I love classical music. I listen to classical music a lot. And somehow it's something that just came in, in me that uh, I want. You know, that melody especially, the one that I did, was one of my favorite of many of Mozart. And uh, I mean, I didn't do a lot of work in it, to be honest with you, I just went there and uh, I didn't even know it was gonna be, you know. I, I mean, I didn't practice much for that. I just had it over here, I went there, and, and we did it, but, you know, I could have done much, much better. But, you know, it's something that, um, it, I just wanted to do something with a skank, trashy, trash beat <laughs> Mozart. You know what I mean? Because the, the song is so, it feels like it's a fast song. It's kind of. It's something where, where I didn't prepare myself as much. You know, I was not as creative. No jazzy stuff, you know, something like technical. I, that's what lacked, the song lacked some more techno, technic, technicality. technicality with the hands. But for me, because I just went, you know, do, do, I wanted to do it like whatever my style of music I was Spain, playing. You were in Spain then, right? You were in Spain? Yeah, I did it over there, yeah. But that's it, you know, I wanted to do that because from, for a long time, because that song was, and who knows, you know, I want to do something else in the future, in the near future, you know, with classical music, because a lot of drummers have done it, and, and they've done some killer, killer jobs. So, yeah, that's something that, you know, I just love classical music, and I think it can be done. You can put drums, <laughs> brutal drums, thrashy drums, speed metal drums. You always practice with these boots? No, 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 no. Because I remember in the videos you always wear these massive yes, I used biker to. boots. Now I, <laughs> now I just have these these tennis shoes. Okay. These Converse that are more, you know, more comfortable for me. For me, it was so impressive. Like, I mean, how can you do the speed with 
anyways, and then with these biker things? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> it's all what you get used to. That's what I've learned. Yeah, sure. I, I can't play barefoot. I need to have... But I bet core. you could if you practice. Yeah, it for sure, six sure, sure. And then you wouldn't want to do it any other way, probably. <laughs> I used to sit low, now I sit high. You know, it's just I found I can dominate the kit more higher, you know. I'm like over the kit. I'm like I used to try to sit as low as possible. You know? I always thought I could read your mind, but not this time. Lavoisin, it is. Okay. That's my solo project. Uh, originally, uh, in 87, it was called Submission, and it was a thrash metal. I did a kind of thrash metal one-man band. And that was just out of necessity, you know what I mean? Because I grew up south of Tampa in a place called Englewood, south of Sarasota. And there's just nobody there. There was no musicians to speak of. And, and so, like, I was always looking to go to Miami or go to Tampa to, to be with a band, but, you know, I lived in this place in the middle of nowhere and so I just did it on my own you know and so that's kind of how it started and then around 15 I went out and bought a little I bought a Kramer striker and a little amp and I would play and and I would do these little uh, had a little recorder and I would record the drums and then I would record the guitar playing along with the drums into another recorder like just you know totally uh, DIY four track if you will you know Pretty much those demo, a lot of those demos ended up becoming early monstrosity. I used a lot, I, I picked through and like the good riffs out of that and used that for some of the Imperial Doom stuff. And then I didn't do anything with it for a long time. And then around 97, I started doing some rock covers and I had this singer guy um, who could sing like Dio. He had that kind of Dio voice and a real kind of a cleaner, almost like Crimson Glory, maybe not quite, but but the guy was a little erratic personality-wise. So I just started singing myself, and then eventually uh, I just wrote songs. I got like 60 songs now, and I, my main thing is I want to get it recorded properly. You know, I've been, I just got demos, and I got a demo studio and stuff, and I can record guitar parts, but I can't really record drums the way I want to because I just don't have the channels and the mics, you know? So I want to go into a big studio and do a real album eventually. Gives you hope. Hope. Hope, yeah, to do what you do. Hope. To do what I do. <laughs> That's not the right word. Well, give me the desire, the, the, the I want to do the, the inspiration. Hope, you mean like uh, hope? I hope that I could do this 10 more years? Yeah, for example. Uh, what gives me hope is that. Um, I am more of a positive thinking guy nowadays, and I feel like, uh, like you know, I mean, I'm getting older, right, as the outside, but when I play, I feel like 20 years younger. So it's like, it's like I don't need no hope. I am the hope. I am making things happen. Uh, when you are on in the positive side, and you deal with positive things in your life, then positive things come to your life, and that becomes good. But when you're dealing on the negative side, the negative things come to your life, and then, you know, that's not me. So, you know, like most people know, I believe in God, and I believe that He is my helper. And why am I back? Well, I wanted to come back because, you know, I wasn't going to give up, just sit. No way, that's not me. I'm not a, I'm not a quitter. But, but I believe with God, I feel more powerful. I have more life, new life, more energy. 
like I've been born again. Come on. Like uh, this is like feels like the when we did the Blessed of the Sick tour, you know, my, my body is fine. So positive, positive things come to you, negative, negative things come to you. It's up to the individual, man. I say thank you guys for giving us this opportunity to be on your show. And I hope that it will, whatever you guys gather today is, is going to be, you know, it's going to work well. And we have a new album. It's coming out in a couple of months. So therefore, we're coming back this year. So please come and see us. Plus, this new album, I know you're going to love it. I love you, everybody. Germany, Europe, United States, <laughs> Mexico, South America. Thank you, guys. We will be seeing you in the future. Viewers of Drum Talk, we will see you next time on tour. Terrorizer. Yeah.